this morning to St. James Presbyterian Church, and we are very glad that you are here. At this time, we invite you to find the friendship pads, which are located in the center of each aisle, to sign them and pass them to those seated near you. And at the end of our service today, please do take the time to greet your brothers and sisters in Christ. By way of announcements, I'd like to remind any of you who are currently serving on session that session meets today beginning at noon with lunch in the Horizon Room. In addition to that, Lent is quickly coming upon us. Ash Wednesday will take place this Wednesday. We will have a service here in the sanctuary at noon that day. In addition to that, we're going to have another time later in the day for anyone who might like to come by for a time of silent worship and reflection. We're going to have our Lenten devotionals ready at that point. You can come and be in the sanctuary for a time of prayer. I will also be present. That begins at 730. And as you come and sit and reflect on what this season means, you could then come forward at any time that you'd like. And as I said, I'll be present for the imposition of ashes. So there are two different times that you can come on Ash Wednesday to be a part of this worshiping community. In addition to that, we're currently in the midst of starting a new pictorial directory. Uh, This is, uh, of course, in the early stages right now. We're going to do all of this in-house. We have a computer program that's going to allow us to do this, and we have several dedicated volunteers who are already all set to go and make this happen for us. But in order to make this happen, we're going to need a couple of people who are willing to take pictures. I overheard one person saying this morning they're able to take pictures. I know we have one person already who signed up for that. Uh, Anyone else who might be willing to take pictures pictures of those in this congregation, generally before or after services, now through Easter, uh, please let us know, and we really appreciate hearing from you. Um, Christian. One of my favorite parts of the church budget is where I am able to purchase new music for our choirs. And the anthem we're doing today is a brand new one, thanks to you for purchasing the music. During the anthem, we have three soloists, Jim Gresham, Don Hoyt, and Amanda Johns. Shut the (laughs) door. And finally, the Pulse Articles are due this week. For any of you that have announcements, events in the life of our community that you would like to express and have the broader community be aware of, please make note that this month, as always, Pulse newsletter articles are due on the 16th. At this time, let us still our minds, let us open our hearts, and let us prepare ourselves for a time of morning worship. Let us worship God. Please rise if you're able to join me in the response of the call to worship printed in your bulletin. 
Great is the Lord. Mighty is the Lord. Holy is the Lord. Let us worship our God and King. The hymn of praise is O Wondrous Sight, O Vision Fair, number 75 in the Blue Hymnal. This is the call to confession. When we come into the holy presence of God, our own humanity is laid bare. When we stand in the living presence of truth, our own falsehood is revealed. People of God, let us acknowledge who we are and ask our ever-present God to forgive us. And now please join me in the prayer of confession. Eternal God, we confess that we do not expect and long for the transforming power of your love to work miracles in these hard hearts of ours. Yet we secretly long for a rescue, an escape, a miracle to relieve us of the responsibilities and the challenges you set before us. Healing Spirit, renew our confidence in your power and in the power of love to change our lives and to give us courage to be the fully responsible people Christ calls us to be. The truth is this, as the heavens opened, God spoke and proclaimed that Christ was the chosen one. Listen to him. Our Savior proclaims that all who truly believe are cleansed of their sin. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Was 
be seated. And at this time, I'd like to invite any children who are worshiping with us to come forward for the children's message. Together, let us sing. brought something forward today to show our children and I was just showing this to Liam I'll hold it up so you can see it too Liam is just now learning to read his letters and he was telling me what these different letters are uh, M-O-M and I said mom and who's that and he goes her mommy so he's super excited about that and then when we turned it upside down because I wanted to show him what it looked like upside down too and then I said it spells W-O-W wow and it can be both of these things right depending upon how we're looking at it it can either be mom or it can be wow and it's all about how our perspective is how we're looking at this and from which angle we have our view Well, today, though it's kind of a complex story and a difficult one to explain to children especially, we're hearing the story of Jesus' transfiguration, the time when his clothes became dazzling white, when there was a voice that came down from God, this is my son, my chosen, listen to him, when Moses and Elijah, the sign of the law and the prophets, were standing among them in their presence, in the presence of these three disciples. Not only did all of these things happen, but in addition to that, these three disciples began to see something new about Jesus. They began to see something different. Their perspective (laughs) changed, and they were able to see Jesus and receive him in a new way. Please bow your heads with me and let us say a word of prayer. Let's pray, Liam. Dear God, we are so thankful that one way of seeing you is not the only way that you give us. We're able to see you from so many different perspectives, which makes you real and full and come to life in front of us. We thank you for the transfiguration which we celebrate this day and for the way that this leads us on a new journey toward the cross and beyond. We pray all of these things in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks for coming forward. I'll see you later. There are a variety of gifts, but it is the same Spirit who gives them. There are different ways of serving God, but it is the same Lord who is served. God works through each person in a unique way. 
but it is God's purpose which is accomplished. To each is given a gift of the Spirit to be used for the common good. Together we are the body of Christ, and individually we are members of it. We are all called into the church of Jesus Christ by baptism and marked as Christ own by the Holy Spirit. This is our common calling to be disciples and servants of our servant Lord. Within the community of the church, some are called to particular service as deacons and elders and ministers of the word and sacrament. Ordination is Christ's gift to the church, assuring that his ministry continues among us, providing for ministries of caring and compassion in the world, ordering the governance of the church, and preaching the word and administering the sacraments. Mr. Moderator, speaking for the people of the church, I call the following persons to be ordained and installed as elders and deacons. Please come forward and face the congregation as I read your names. Elders, Alice Beatty, Gail Fuller, and Peter Vanderveen. Deacons, Mark Beatty, Julie Kyes, Cheryl McGregor, Gretchen Fuller, Irene Rome, Jean Cedar, and Rick Cedar. My friends, God has called you by the voice of the church to serve Jesus Christ in a special way. You know who we are and what we believe, and you understand that work for which you have been chosen. So we invite you now at this time to please state your purpose by answering these questions. Do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior? Acknowledge him, Lord of all and head of the church. And through him, believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you? Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and the New Testaments to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the church universal and God's word to you? Do you? Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith, as expressed in the confessions of our church, as authentic and reliable expositions of what Scripture leads us to believe and do? And will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? Do you and will you? Will you fulfill your office in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture, And be continually guided by our confessions. Will you? Will you be governed by our church's polity? And will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry? Working with them subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit. Will you? Will you seek in your own life to follow the Lord Jesus Christ? Love your neighbors and work for the reconciliation of the world. Will you? Do you promise to further the, per- the peace, unity, and purity of the church? Do you? Will you seek to serve people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? Will you? This question is for the elders. Will you be a faithful elder? watching over the people, providing for their worship, nurture, and service. Will you share in government and discipline, serving in governing bodies of the church? And in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? Will you? And this question is for the deacons. Will you be a faithful deacon, teaching charity, urging concern, and directing the people's help to the friendless and those in need. 
in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? Will you? Do you, the members of the church, accept these servants as elders and deacons, chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ? We, will you encourage them to respect their decisions and to follow as they guide us? Serving Jesus Christ, who alone is the head of the church. Will you? We will. At this time, I invite our new deacons and elders to please turn and face me. I would also invite them to please kneel on the step in front of you or on the carpet there, if you are able. If you're not, we certainly understand. And at this time, all in the congregation who have been ordained at any point as ministers of word and sacrament, as elders, or as deacons, we invite you to come forward and lay hands either on one of these folks who are in front of us or the person in front of you. together let us pray. Gracious and eternal God, with joy we give you all thanks and praise. In every time and place you have chosen servants from among your people to point the way to salvation. Above all, we praise you for Jesus Christ, who came not to be served but to serve and to give his life to set others free. Anointed by your Holy Spirit, he proclaimed your reign on earth, revealing your saving love in all that he said and did. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon your servants, whom you called through baptism, claimed as your own, and marked and sealed for this purpose. Grant them the same mind that was in Christ Jesus. Give them a spirit of truthfulness, that they may show the compassion of Christ in the actions of daily living and rightly govern your people. Give them the gifts of your Holy Spirit to build up the church, to strengthen the common life of your people, and to lead with compassion and vision. In the walk of faith and for the work of ministry, give to your servants gladness and strength, discipline and hope, humility, humor, and courage, and an abiding sense of your presence. Amen. Please stand. Friends, you are now deacons and elders in the church of Jesus Christ and for this congregation. Be faithful and true in your ministry so that your whole life may bear witness to the crucified and the risen Lord. We welcome you to this ministry. With thankfulness, we give in gratitude and joy. With prayerfulness, we give in sacrifice and love. With hopefulness, we give in commitment to God. The ushers will please come forward.
God of wonder, we offer you these humble gifts, signs of your goodness and mercy. Receive them with our gratitude that through, through us, all people may know the riches of your love and the word made flesh. Amen. This is the prayer for illumination. Holy God, you revealed to the disciples the everlasting glory of Jesus Christ. Grant us, who have not seen and yet believe, the gift of your Holy Spirit, that we may boldly live the gospel and shine with your transforming glory as people changed and changing through the redeeming presence of our Savior. Amen. The first lesson is from Exodus chapter 34, verses 29 to 35. If you'd like to follow along, it's on page 81 in the Pew Bible. The Shining Face of Moses Moses came down from Mount Sinai. As he came down from the mountain with the two tablets of the covenant in his hand, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shown because he had been talking with God. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, the skin of his face was shining, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses spoke with them. Afterward, all the Israelis came near, and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, the Israelites would see the face of Moses, the skin of his face was shining, and Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with the Lord. The word of the Lord. Every 
Greetings all right. Greetings all right. All right. Our second lesson this morning comes to us from the Gospel of Luke in the ninth chapter. Hear the word of God. Now, about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighted down with sleep. But since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them. They were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent. And in those days told no one of any of these things that they had seen. The Gospel of the Lord. It seems to me that there are certain milestones in each of our lives when those around us begin to see us differently. Perhaps you know what I mean. I'm reminded here of graduation or marriage or the birth of a child, that first full-time job, a season of military service, or well-earned retirement. We view others differently, don't we, when they've suffered greatly for one reason or another, when they've overcome major adversities in their lives and now they're there on the other side talking about their experiences, or when they've accomplished something significant with their skills and their talents, when we see their giftedness right in front of our eyes, we begin to see them differently. We begin to view others in a different light when they provide help for us in a time of need or when they offer just the right words at just the right time. Those moments, those holy moments are times when we give thanks. We give thanks that we're a part of that and that we can see it and that it becomes a part of our journey. And while I certainly recognize and appreciate those moments whenever I see them myself, it always makes me a bit uncomfortable when I'm on the other side of that and someone is seeing me in a different light, what I do for a living or something that I've done in the world outside of these walls. Previously, I've mentioned that my grandmother has been ill She's had Alzheimer's for a number of years now. She's currently under care of hospice in Alabama. And I've also made it known that for a number of years now, years ago when she was feeling much better, she asked me personally if I might be responsible for officiating at her funeral service. The service is scheduled to take place in the very church where both of my parents were raised. They both knew each other from the time that they were infants in arms. Both my parents were baptized at this church. I was baptized there. My brother was baptized there. We have this great connection of family and friendships 
that go back for many years and which I have been a part of whenever I venture back to that part of the world. Well, lately, as I've been planning for that event, I've also been thinking about my return to that particular town, the town of my birth, the town that I left when I was only four years old, now returning, much as I have for years now, but returning in a very different way because this time I'm returning to fulfill my grandmother's wishes. And I know that as a result of that, many will be seeing me differently and will be seeing me in the role of pastor for the very first time because no longer am I that youngest cousin, the one that was always knee high, Little John, now I will be someone that comes before them with a certain degree of responsibility, a certain degree of authority, a new role, a new way of being seen. That's going to be a little bit uncomfortable for me in several ways. Well, this morning we gather together on Transfiguration Sunday with this passage about Jesus and his journey to the mountaintop, this journey of Jesus being completely transformed. And we're immediately drawn to the miraculous part of this encounter, this dramatic appearance, this dramatic change in the way that he looked, the way that others were perceiving him. We see that with him were Moses and Elijah. We talked about that a little bit in the children's message. We also heard about that clear voice from heaven. This was a defining moment, a moment of God breaking into the ordinary. Remember, these guys just thought that they were going up on the mountain to pray. And yet, if we stay in that place where we're thinking only about the miraculous, then I think we might miss the other part of this story. That is, the particular way that the perceptions were changed for those three disciples. That's Peter and James and John. Because not only did something happen to Jesus there on the mountain, but something happened to those three disciples as well. Everything that they saw and everything that they heard began to change them, to transform them in a way you could say that they were the ones who were transfigured. No longer was Jesus just another figure in the biblical drama, not just another Moses, not just another Elijah, but he became in that moment the very fulfillment of all of their hopes, the very son of God. That was Jesus' word there from God in that moment. This is my son, my chosen, listen to him. They were standing in the presence of the Messiah. Such was the power of that transfiguring moment in their lives. You know, it pains me to admit that it initially began as a coincidence that we chose to install and ordain deacons and elders on this very day. Of course, we had a number of dates that we could have done this. And we looked at our schedules and we tried to work everything out so that we could have the most people present here to participate in the installation and the ordination. I wish that I could tell you that it was a part of my grander plan for today to match that event up with the transfiguration text which are in front of us. But in the midst of all of those logistical discussions and decisions that needed to be made, as we tried to find the best service and Sunday to do this, it seems to me that God managed to be a part of the process anyway. And in time, I began to see the significance of these two events coming together on the very same day, and I began to view each of them in a different way, because I began to see how fitting it is to install deacons and elders on a day when we are talking about seeing things differently. It's not so different from those earliest disciples, is it? 
They went to the mountain with a certain expectation. They were there to pray with Jesus. And as time went by, they began to see things differently. Their eyes were opened to a different way of seeing. For those who stood before us this morning, those deacons and those elders that we just installed and ordained, their lives are no longer just as they always have been. Because this new class of deacons and this new class of elders has a new purpose. They are chosen by God. They are made visible and full in this community of faith. And in the weeks and the months and the years to come, we each may begin to see them differently in a new way as representatives of God Almighty. These are my chosen servants. Listen to them. And all along the way, we may begin to realize that no matter what we or what they may have had in mind, that God's plan continues to work through us. God's plan continues to work through each and every one of us, through the decisions that we make, through our conversations, transforming even the words that we use and the actions that we make on behalf of this community for the greater glory of God. Well, you know, I'm often reminded that the church spends a great deal of time talking about seeing things in a new way. If you've spent much time in any church, you know that this is a common theme, seeing things anew. This is such a common theme in every church life that we may begin to wonder what exactly is going on if things don't seem very new in our lives. Have you ever been there? A point in your life where you are hearing a sermon like this one about everything becoming new and you said, if everything is so new, why does it feel so same? And it began to make you sad and you began to wonder about God's power and if God was really working in your life at all. But if you find yourself in that particular place this morning, then I invite you to consider this. In my conversations with all kinds of different people, I've never met anyone who denied the existence of death. We all know why that is the case. All we have to do is look around us, look at our surroundings, Look at the natural cycle of life and the way things are in front of us. And we know that that death is part of our common human existence. That's not very hard to acknowledge, is it? But what's a lot harder to acknowledge than that is the existence of the resurrection. Lent begins on Wednesday. And with it comes the newness of life about which we have been speaking. The newness of life which will descend upon us as we make this journey toward the cross, death, and beyond. The resurrection. Today and the transfiguration of our Lord prepares us to see in a new way. To affirm that Christ is glorified. And in the days ahead, whether we notice only this death or whether we also bear witness to the promise of new life is strictly a matter of our seeing. It is a matter of our hearing. It is a matter of our perceiving as Christ becomes the very fulfillment of all of our hopes. That's what's at stake And that's what we're here for. Will we see it? Will we hear it? Will we perceive it anew? May it be so. And thanks be to God, now and forever. Amen.
Please stand and let us affirm our faith together. My only comfort in life and in death is that I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. Please remain standing and let us sing together. be seated. In your prayers this morning, please remember Lois Gray. Lois has been at St. James, uh, sorry, at uh, St. Joseph's for about a week now. She's had various concerns with her lungs and also with her kidney, and we invite uh, prayers for her. We took her a prayer shawl this week, which she greatly appreciated. Her health continues to ebb and flow, and so it's a very touchy time for her, and we certainly invite you, if you have connections with Lois, to go and to see her in the hospital and to continue that journey with her. In addition, we're thankful this morning for the flowers which are in front of us. They're given in memory of Mary Ellen Clark, the mother of Kathleen Laughlin, who writes, uh, in memory of my beloved mother, I miss you with love your daughter, Kathleen. Together, let us bow our heads together and offer a word of prayer. Let us pray. You are all wise and majestic, O God. We approach you with awe and with wonder. You set our sights on lofty height. You stoop to hear our cries and our pleas. You spoke through your servant Moses, delivering your commandments etched out of stone. And you have come with power in your Son, Jesus Christ, bringing redemption to all who believe. We are your people, O God, called by you and commissioned 
to serve. We still search for guidance in understanding our tasks. and In the midst of the decisions we face, you can at times seem so distant and removed from the scene. We need the assurance of your presence and the memory of your Son to illumine our way. So we declare our faith in the Christ with whom you are well pleased. At times, those words seem so empty. Our hearts are still hardened, and society goes on its way. Yet we cling to your promise. So help us to believe without seeing and to endure for Christ's sake even when our efforts seem fruitless. You have sent us the Holy Spirit as our guide. We desperately need your spirit of wisdom and truth. Help us to move with love as we seek to meet particular concerns and to listen as long as it takes to do what is appropriate in our tangled world. Our journey in faith goes on without ceasing. Save us from complacency with what we have done and from fear of what you expect us yet to do. And as you give meaning to our past, order and direct our present so that our future, your future, our shared future may be shaped by your action in our lives this day. We pray silently. And finally, together as the people of God, we offer the prayer that Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand and let us sing together our closing hymn.
please receive this blessing and notice that you have a part in this as well. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Please share this peace with those seated near you.